Thank you very much. Thank you for this kind introduction. So, so this is the table of contents, but this is the the aim of the talk. Uh, you'll see the table of contents many times. So, so the aim of the talk is to compare the the reduction by the redu to compare the reduction relation by continuous function known as the wage order on the subsets of integers equipped with two different topologies. So on one side the contour space, the well-known contour space, and the other side the scope domain. Uh, the difference will be between um, on the counter space um, having some positive and negative information about the objects, while on the Scott domain we only have uh, positive information. We don't get the negative information. I'll explain it to you a little bit uh, later. But they are similar, but you'll see the wage order is very different. So what is the, the, the counter space? I mean, most of the things I will say uh, are well known by some of you and they, they may seem trivial, but this is the counter space. This is the full binary tree uh, equipped with uh, the following topology induced by this metric. The distance between two infinite sequences of zeros and one is two, two minus the first integer n such that the sequence x and the sequence y, they differ, right? If they are different, otherwise it's zero. So this metric yields uh, the following basis. O of u, so a basic open set induced by a finite set of, integer of um, zeros and one u is just the set of all infinite sequences of zeros and one that extends my finite sequence u, right? So it's well known that it's a compact space. It's also complete for zero dimensional Polish spaces. By this, I mean every dimensional zero Polish space is uh, homeomorphic to some pi zero to subset of the counter space. So they all reflect inside the, the, the counter space, so to speak. If I compare this to the Scott domain, well, the Scott domain is so the, 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 the set of all the subsets of the, um, of the integers equipped with the Scott topology. So what is this? this Scott topology, it's the one generated by the following basis. So O of F, given F some finite set of integers, O of F is the set of all subset of the integers that extend my X. So it's very similar in, in a sense to, 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 to the counters topology. On one side, you have finite sequence and every sequence that extends this one. Here you have a finite set and every set that extends this one, right? Uh, you don't have a metric, but you have a quasi-metric. So the distance between x and y, given two uh, here, two sets of, uh, of integers, is two to minus, well, the minimum integer that belongs to x, but does not belong to y, if this is possible, which means if x is not included in y, or the y is going to be zero. So you see right away by, by, by looking at this that it's... Uh, this quasi-metric is not necessarily symmetric. It's compact also, and uh, since the, the previous one, the, um, um, the counter space was complete for Polish spaces, this one is also complete for quasi-Polish spaces in the sense that, written here, every quasi-Polish space is homomorphic to some pi zero two subset of the Scott domain. So they seem similar, um, the the the, 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 the the counter space with respect to sorry the counter space and the um, and Polish spaces on one side the the Scott domain and the quasi Polish spaces on the other side so I'm concentrating now on the the counter space so a few words about the Borel hierarchy Be, before explaining how we get this hierarchy I want to uh, show you how they look like so. The Borel hierarchy, I give the definition here, which is well known. You got the sigma zero one, the set of open sets, pi zero alpha, the set of the complements of the sets that, are be that belong to sigma zero alpha. Delta zero alpha is just the intersection of the sigma class and the pi class at the same level. And sigma zero alpha is just the set of all the countable unions of sets that you've taken in pi classes at lower level. I'm writing this down because it's going to be a very a slightly different when we, we talk about quasi Polish spaces and in particular about the, uh, the Scott domain. And of course, the Borel hierarchy is the union of all the sigma zero alpha 
and it's well known that, for instance, on the counter space, it does not collapse. You really have uh, omega one many levels. So it looks like this. This is this beautiful ladder with uh, omega one many levels. So the wedge hierarchy, it looks exactly the same. So exactly the same shape, exactly the same thing, except it's much longer, except it's a huge refinement. How does it go? So it would be probably better to write things this way. So this is the, the class of sigma zero one. Let's say we inside the, the counter space, so the set of all the open sets, the set of all the closed set in between the set of uh, all the closed open sets. Now I have the sigma zero two, the countable unions of uh, closed sets, the, co the complements of the, the, the previous ones, the pi zero two, the delta zero two, and it goes on like this, right? And then I'm only writing down the delta zero class, the classes that are in between, the intersection between the sigma and the pi classes. So it goes like this. Then you have the union of the delta zero n, uh, which would be exactly the same as the union of the sigma zero n or the union of the pi zero n. On top of that, you have sigma zero omega and pi zero omega. So Wesh told me one day, he, uh, he proved that, I mean, I, I guess it was open that uh, the, 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 the union of the delta zero n is not the intersection of sigma zero omega and pi zero omega, which means delta zero omega, the sets that are both sig inside sigma zero omega and pi zero omega, uh, these are not necessarily the sets that belong to um, some delta zero n. Uh, I'll explain it why, why he, I'll explain it how he proved it, but also why it's not, uh, it seems strange now that uh, it was not known there. So above, you have this, sigma zero omega, the delta zero omega, the delta zero omega. So this is, sorry, this is the union of the delta zero n, which corresponds to this blue uh, dotted line. Delta zero omega, this is way bigger, and it continues above like this, right? Okay. That's for the Borel hierarchy. Another hierarchy that refines this one, the hausdorff kuratowski hierarchy, the hierarchy of differences of, uh, of sets taken in some class sigma zero alpha. So it slices down the delta zero alpha plus one into how many, how many classes? Omega one many classes, the psi differences of sigma zero alpha. So I'll explain right now what are these differences? Probably you all know, but this is the difference. Imagine that this blue set, this purple set, it's a sigma zero alpha set. This is a difference of one sigma zero alpha because this is this sigma zero alpha. Now I'm taking another sigma zero alpha, the yellow one, which is located inside the, 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 the first one. And the difference of the two is all, everything that is purple. So everything that belongs to the first one, but does not belong to the second one, right? If you want three, you continue like this. You get the third one, which is included in the second one. And now you still get everything which is purple, right? And you, you want a difference of four, you get four. You want a difference of five, you get five like this. And you keep on going like that uh, into the transfinite and you can imagine how it's done. So this is how you get the differences of psi sigma zero alpha, for instance. Okay, so now it looks like this, you got Sigma zero two, pi zero two. And how many classes do you have? Well, the, the delta zero two level, the, the, sorry, the class of delta zero two subsets of the counter space will be, um, um, will be a slice down, so to speak, uh, into omega one many um, hausdorff kuratowski uh, classes. So omega one many level for this hausdorff kuratowski hierarchy. If I keep on going, Further up, I will have at the level sigma zero three pi zero three, another omega one many uh, levels. So omega one plus omega one, omega one multiplied by two. If I keep on going like this, if I reach the union of the delta zero n, I will have omega one plus omega one plus omega one, omega many times, omega one to omega many times. So if I do that for the whole Borel hierarchy, I will have omega one multiplied by omega one many. Um, level, so omega one square. Let's compare this to the wage hierarchy. Well, the wage hierarchy at this level, let's say with at the level number one. Here we at the level omega one. It doesn't change from the house of Kuratowski hierarchy. It doesn't refine it. But as soon as you get further up, 
at the level number three, sigma 0, 3 and pi 0, 3, this is sliced down into omega 1 to omega 1 many um, uh, different um, wedge classes. If we go above, if you get the union of the delta 0 n, how many levels do you have inside the wedge hierarchy? That many levels. So you take omega 1 to omega 1 to omega 1, do, you do that n times, and you take the supremum for um, n, uh, an integer. Well, this ordinal is, in fact, the first fixed point of the exponentiation of base omega 1, right? If you compose this, if you take omega 1 to this ordinal, then you get the same ordinal. This is the first one. But if you go to this level, so sigma 0 omega, or delta 0 omega, that would be uh, the same idea, then you're reaching the omega 1 fixed point of the operation that maps x to omega 1 x. So at the previous level, it was the first fixed point, now it's the omega 1 fixed point. So there are plenty of sets in between. So delta 0 omega and the union of the delta 0 n, they're very different. And the third, okay, one slide to explain how, how it goes. So the Borel hierarchy, you have omega 1 many level. The hausdorff turatowski hierarchy on the Borel sets omega 1 square many level. In order to compute how many levels you have in the wedge hierarchy for the Borel sets, the Borel subsets of the counter space, you need to consider these functions V alpha. So what is V alpha? The first V1, V0, it maps beta to omega 1 to beta. So it's just the exponentiation of base omega, omega 1. But for the rest of them, omega alpha, it enumerates the ordinals of uncountable cofinality that are fixed points of all the previous V zeta for zeta less than, than, less than alpha. So this means, for instance, that um, this ordinal is V1 of omega 1. This one was V1 of 1. And how many levels do you have inside the wedge hierarchy? V omega 1 of 1, in other words, the supremum of V alpha of 1 for alpha less than omega 1. So you need to consider that uncountably many uh, operations like this, known as Veblen, uh, Veblen functions. Okay, so to give you an idea, at this level, V1 of 1, of one that, that was a bit, bit below. Now I have V1 of omega 1 at the level here. And then above v1 of omega 1 to omega 1 and it goes on uh, and the further up you go the 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 the, the faster this um, this the, the, this function goes okay so now the continuous reduction on the on the counter space which uh, gives you the wedge hierarchy how it's defined a few things about it so of course i guess you all know that given two subsets of the counter space you say that A reduces to B if only if there exists a continuous function that witnesses the, the continuous, re, the, 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 um, yeah, the, the reduction relation. So, sorry. Uh, it, computer scientists, they would say A is less complicated than B if there exists a simple function such that the problem of knowing whether X belongs to X comes down to computing whether f of x belongs to b. That's what a reduction relation is. For us, simple functions mean continuous function. And this is equivalent to saying that 2 has a winning strategy in the wedge game. That was the, the main tool uh, developed by, by, by wedge that we'll uh, describe in, in a few seconds now. We said that a set is complete for a given class if it belongs to the class and it reduces, my, my B reduces every element from the class, right? That's what it means to be complete. And the wedge class is nothing but a topological class which contains a complete set. Okay, that's for the definition. A wedge degree is some class of um, wedge equivalent subset. I'm gonna use 
this notion for a is wedge equivalent to b if a reduces to b and b reduces to a and a is strictly below b if a reduces to b but b does not reduce to a so this is classical the wedge game now uh, you have two players one and two one is in charge of a two is in charge of uh, b they play zeros and one because we are inside the um, counter space except then two can pass, two can skip, two can decide from time to time. I'm not playing any uh, zeros, no one. While one always has to play a zero or a one, right? And one starts the game, as I as shown. At the end, they will have produced for one an infinite sequence of zeros and one, x. For two, a finite or infinite sequence of zeros and one, y. Two wins if the y that two has produced is infinite. And otherwise, otherwise to lose is right. And X is in A if and only if Y is in B. So this is the condition. So that what you get is exactly what we had before. Two as a winning strategy in the game between A and B, if and only if there exists a continuous function that witnesses the reduction relation, which means A reduces to B. So now it's in terms of a the existence of a winning strategy for a second player. Okay. Basic properties of the wage order on the on the counter space. So this relation is reflexive essentially because the uh, the identity is a continuous function. It's transitive because when you compose to continuous function, you get a continuous function. But with determinacy, you get much better. You get that it is a well quasi ordered. So assuming determinacy. So this was proved by Martin and Monk uh there is no infinite descending sequence like this and you cannot find three incomparable uh subsets of the Borel um, class a b and c right this uh is um, uh, is implied by a wedge lemma that says if a does not reduce to b then you have that b reduced to the complement of a if you take this into account and if you assume that you have three incomparable A, B, and C, that you get a contradiction. So you have no infinite anti-chain, you have no infinite descending chain like this. So this is a WQ. Okay, so this was well known. Uh, maybe just for the culture. Uh, yeah. um, Borel determinacy implies Borel wedge determinacy. So this implication up there is completely, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an exercise. For the other direction, people thought that maybe you had equivalence between the two. At least that's what Lubo told me. And uh, this came from the fact that in 78, uh, Harrington had proved that sigma 1 1 determinacy, so the determinacy for uh, the Gell Stewart games where um, you had analytic sets was equivalent to sigma 1-1 one, one de wedge determinacy. So determinacy for the wedge game when you have analytic sets. And people thought that maybe you still had this equivalence between uh, Borel determinacy and Borel wedge determinacy. It turns out that Borel determinacy is a way um, uh, weaker statement. In fact, it is provable Borel wedge determinacy in a fragment of second order arithmetic. Whereas Borel determinacy uh, requires uh, uncountably many iteration of the power set operation uh, starting from the from the integers, right? That was a result due to Harvey Friedman, which came a few years before Tony Martin gave the proof of Borel determinacy, and it was a result that gave Tony Martin the idea of the kind of uh, of object that should occur uh, inside the proof. So, okay. We may ask, uh, when is it the case that the wedge order on the Borel subset of a Polish space is a WQ? So essentially, it's a WQ on the counter space, on the um, on the bare space. But what about the other Polish spaces? So the complete answer was given by by Schlicht, who proved that the wedge order on the Borel subset of a Polish space it's a WQ if and only if your uh, Polish space is zero-dimensional. 
So if it's not zero dimensional, it's not a WQO, otherwise it is. And there was a, recently a complete classification of um, uh, these um, wage order by Carwa, Motoros, and uh, Scamperti. So everybody's here except Raphael. Yeah. So one little thing. The notion of being self-dual, which is crucial, a set is a set, so a subset of the counter space is self-dual if and only if it satisfies that it reduces to its complement, right? The picture is like this inside the wage hierarchy. These are the classes or the degrees um, uh, generated by self-dual sets. These are the degrees generated by non self dual sets, right? It is extremely easy to describe the sets that belong to self dual classes on the basis on the one that belongs to the non self dual classes. The other way around is not easy at all. So, why is it easy? A set A is self-dual, so I'm looking at a set, a subset of the counter space. If and only if you can find some non-self-dual set B, such that A is what? A is the set of all the sequences that, if it starts with a one, it continues with X that belongs to B. If it starts with a zero, it continues with X that does not belong to B. So if you are in charge of the set A inside a wedge game, up to wage equivalent, it's exactly like if you are in, in charge of the following set, this one, and from the viewpoint of a player, it means on my first move, if I play one, I mean, okay, I play one, I erase the one, and I'm in charge of B. And if I play zero, it means I'm, uh, I'm going to, I play zero, I erase it right away, but now I'm in charge of uh, the complement of B, right? You decide on first move who you're in charge of. Okay, so... This is to motivate that the classes generated by non self dual sets, in some sense, the non, non self dual sets, they, 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 it, it's, it's really hard to get them from the self dual sets, but the self dual sets are easy to get from the non self dual sets. So, wh wh why not getting rid of the self dual sets and getting only the, the non self dual ones? So, this is something I did some time ago, long time ago, in fact. Considering the, so I'm advertising something that I did and that, that that's been, uh, so it had, it had some success in, uh, in, um, in computer science. Consider it, con, I call them conciliatory sets. So a conciliatory set is just something of the, a, set, a subset of the, of this set, a set of, all, of infinite sequences of zeros and one, and also finite sequences of zeros and one. You just add the finite sequences to the counter space, but you don't consider the topology on the counter space, right? And how do you go from uh, this space, this set, sorry, of infinite sequences of zeros and one to the counter space? Well, through this set, so here I'm considering three letters, zero, one, and another one pass. You can guess why pass, right? Because when you play a game, uh, the wave game from time to time, if you play it too, you have to pass. So it's about passing here. So three letters and infinite sequences of these three letters with the, 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 the usual topology, which means the product topology of the discrete topology on this set of three letters, which is homeomorphic to the counter space. So you go from one to the other by forming this. If you give me a set B, which is a set like this, it's a set of finite and infinite sequences of zeros and one, I will form B pass, which is the set of all infinite sequences of zeros, ones, plus this other letter pass, so that once you, you, you remove every occurrence of the, let, of the letter pass, what you get belongs to B, right? So for instance, if my sequence would be pass, 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 only pass, when I remove the pass, I, I get the empty sequence. Okay, so there is no topology on this set, and I will explain to you that uh, there's, there's a good reason why there's no topology. 
but given any topological class gamma, any set conciliatory set B, I can say B belongs to gamma. So I may say B is open, B is closed, B is Borel. By this, I mean B pass is open, B pass is closed, B pass is Borel, because B pass, B pass is really a subset of this topological space, which is homomorphic to the concert space. Okay. From wedge games to conservatory games. So one of the advantages of uh, these uh, sets, the conservatory set, is this. The conservatory game. So please don't read this. I, I will explain what the, what the, what the, what the game is. Uh, so I have A and B, two sets of finite and infinite sequences, possibly, right? And the set, the, the game, I call it CAB for C for conservatory. And I write A re reduces to B. The C stands for conservatory. If and only if two has a winning strategy in the, in, in the following game. So the game, I'll explain it right, right away. So you have two players. It's just like the wage game, except that one start, but one can pass. And two can pass too. So they can pass or they can play zeros and one as many as they want. So if they want to pass all the way, they will only pass. They will not play anything, in fact. At the end, after omega many moves, you end up with x that has been played by player one. So you, you don't count the pass, of course. You, you count x0, which is 0, 1, x1, which is 0, 1, and so on and so forth. So you get x, you get y that has been played by 2, and you say 2 wins if and only if x belongs to a, if and only if y belongs to b. So it's exactly like the wage game, except that now it's, it's symmetric. There's no difference between 1 and 2. No, there's no difference between 1 not skipping and 2 skipping possibly infinitely often. Now they can both skip as many as they want to, but at the end, it doesn't matter whether what has been played by one is finite or infinite, because the sets A and B, they are sets of finite or infinite sequences. Okay, clearly something completely obvious. One has a winning strategy in the game that I've just described, if and only if the same player won as a winning strategy in the game when you replace, in the wage game, where you replace A by A pass, and B by B pass. Essentially, I mean, it's completely trivial. In this game, when, you, when one plays pass, here it pl plays the letter pass. And here, when, when, when one plays the letter pass, here just one just passes. So same thing for two, so uh, there's a nice symmetry between the two. One has a winning strategy so one of the winning strategy in the game between A and the complement of A, I will show it to you. So this means that it's not true that two has a winning strategy in this game, but two has a winning strategy in this game would say that A is uh, self-dual. So what we have is A does not reduce to the complement of A because one has a re uh, winning strategy. So every conciliatory set is non-self-dual. There is no self-dual set. That's cool because we wanted to get rid of the self dual sets. We have no non self dual set. What is true? I need a winning strategy for one in this game. One will do that. If I'm player one, I pass. And then whatever player two does, I copy what player two does, right? We will end up with exactly the same sequences, y and y. And of course, Y belongs to A if and only if Y does not belong to the complements of A, so trivially one wins. So this shows you that it's never the case that two has a winning strategy in the game between A and the complement of A. Therefore, there, there are no um, self-dual sets. There are only um, non-self-dual sets. More interesting than that. Here I wrote with some determinacy. By this, I mean, if you are considering the Borel set, you already have determinant C. This would work for analytic sets, uh, sigma one, two, if you have determinant C for a given class. But just think that we're talking about the Borel set, so we have determinant C. A subset of the bare space, of the counter space, sorry, is non self dual, so the ones we're interested in inside the real um, counter space, if and only if 
There exists some conservatory set, so a set of finite and infinite sequence, such that A is wedge equivalent to B pass. Remember, B pass is just you go from being inside this set to being inside the, the counter space by, by cramming up every uh, sequence that belong to B. We can do even better. So we can say this is equivalent to say there exists A finite, a set of finite sequences now, such that A is equivalent to what? To A plus I add to A this set of finite sequences and I cram it every uh, sequence that belongs to this set with passes. Okay. So this tells you that the wedge hierarchy restricted to non self dual sets is in fact isomorphic to the conservatory hierarchy. So it's uh, uh, it's what we wanted. So the, the two hierarchies, they're exactly the same. And um, yeah, so in my view, if you want to study the, 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 the wedge hierarchy and you're interested in the um, non self dual sets, it's probably better to work with the conservatory hierarchy. You have more tools. I mean, it's it's easier. I mean, the, the game being symmetric, everything is, um, is finer, in my view. You may say, yes, there is no topology on this space, but uh, could we get a topology? So there's, there's this result by, by Jan Pequeno, which says the set of finite and infinite sequences of zeros and one endowed with the prefix topology, right? This means uh, a basic open set is a finite sequence extended by anything, uh, yields that the conservatory hierarchy, let's say for Borel subset, is the same as the hierarchy induced by reduction by relatively continuous relations on this space. And what is a, con a reduction by a relatively continuous relation? So this is definition due to Bratka, uh, Hetling, and Weihau. If X and Y are second countable T0 spaces, a total relation from uh, X to Y is relatively continuous if and only if for some admissible representations, rho X and rho Y, there exists F from the domain of the of rho X to the domain of rho Y, which is continuous, such that for every element inside the domain of rho x, uh, this rho x of this element and rho y of f of this element satisfy the relation R. So this was a nice result by Jan Pequeno, a former PhD student. Uh, yeah, I won't define this, but relatively continuous relation is nice. Why don't we try to get a better topology such that the conciliatory, the conciliatory hierarchy would be uh, the one induced by um, reduction by continuous functions instead instead of uh, relatively continuous relations. And uh, I've been asked the question several times, and thanks to Ricardo Camerlo, uh, I know that, that uh, it's impossible. We don't have to look for it. There is no topology on this set such that the conciliatory hierarchy, the, the, um, the disordering, the constitutory ordering, coincide with the reduction by continuous function. So don't try to put a topology on it. Okay, I'll skip this since I, yeah, I'll skip this. Okay, quasi polish spaces. Uh, so I'm going back to, uh, to the, um, the Scott domain, but slowly. First of all, quasi Polish spaces. So quasi stands for quasi metric. So uh, recall what a metric is. So it satisfies these three property, right? Uh, the second one is the uh, triangular inequality, right? And the second, the third one is the symmetry. You take these three properties and you drop the last one. You drop the symmetry. You only take the the, the first two one. And then you get the notion of a quasi-metric. And the topology generated by open balls is uh, the following. An open ball of center C and the uh, radius R is the set of all the X's, so that the distance between C and X is below R, as you can expect. Okay. Now, a quasi-metric, it induces 
the metric, so I call it the quasi-metric D. It induces the quasi-metric D hat, which is defined this way. D hat, the distance between X and Y is the maximum of the distance between X and Y and the distance between Y and X um, from the, the, the quasi-metric. So you recover the symmetry by, by doing this. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, examples of, of, of quasi-metric. So on the Scott domain, you say that if X and Y are two subsets of the integers, the distance between X and Y is 2 to minus. You take the minimum element that belongs to X but does not belong to Y. If X is not included in Y, of course, otherwise it's zero, right? So you see that it's, it's not going to be symmetric. If you have X included in Y and strictly included in Y, the distance between X and Y will not be the, the same as the distance between Y and X. If you do this, th this distance, the hat, the hat, sorry, is just uh, the usual metric on the counter space. Recover this one. Okay. In a quasi-metric space, a sequence Xn is Cauchy if for all real epsilon there exists n0 such that for all m greater than n greater than n0 the distance between xn and xm is less than epsilon of course this matters that you you're looking at the distance between the the, the first one x and the next one xm right you, you, the, the other ring uh, the other um, really matters here as space is comp um, XD, sorry, is a complete quasi-metric space if every Cauchy sequence converges with respect to the, the, the distance induced by the quasi-distance, the quasi-metric, right? Okay, that's for the definition. So quasi-Polish spaces, they are a way of unifying Polish spaces and the omega algebraic and omega continuous domains. Uh, I'll explain what they are. I mean, this is probably my goal for the next 10 minutes to explain what omega algebraic and omega continuous domains are, still while preserving a, a very rich uh, descriptive set theory. So, this is the picture. You have the metrizable world, the non metrizable world. Inside the metrizable world, you have separable, completely metrizable spaces, the Polish spaces. Inside the non metrizable world, you have the DCPOs. So, I'll explain what they are. They are Post sets in which every directed subset has a supremum. I'll explain it uh, in, a, in, in a few seconds. Among these DCPOs, you have omega continuous domain and the quasi Polish space, Polish spaces. They contain all the Polish spaces, but also all the omega continuous domains. So it's a nice generalization of the Polish spaces. Okay. Uh, uh, I recall really. Uh, few points about um, some separation axioms in general topology that you all know, right? Being housed off means if you have two points, there exists an open set that contains the first one, and there exists an open set that contains the second one so that uh, they do not intersect. Uh, when you are, so being housed off is called also being T2. Being T1, called being fresh usually, means that singleton are closed. In other words, if you have two points, you have an open set that contains what one of the two points but does not contain the other one and an open set that contains the other one but does not contain the first one for t0 spaces the same idea as before except you replaced and by or right and these are called uh, kolmogorov usually okay uh examples of uh, quasi polish spaces so first the definition the topology space is quasi polish if and only if it is countably based and completely quasi-metrizable. So two different examples, a very simple one, the Cypriskin space, and the, the second one is the one that we're interested in, the Scott domain. Uh, okay, the first one, the Cypriskin space, completely trivial. You have two elements, zero and one, and the topology is as below. Every subset is an open set except singleton zero. Right? So it's a T0 space, but not T1. So it's not metrizable because metrizable spaces are 
a T2. Um, you can get an open set that contains one, it is here, but does not contain zero, that's fine. But you cannot find an open set that contains zero, but does not contain one. If you want to contain zero, you have to be the whole space, right? So that's it. The Scott domain. So the topology I already told you, it's generated by the following basis. So you take O of F, where F is finite, a finite set. O of F is just the set of all the subsets of omega, which extend my F, right? So you take F and every set that, that extends your, 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 your finite F, that's your basic open set. It's a T0 space, it's not T1, therefore it's not metrizable. Uh, if X minus one is different from the empty set and Y minus X is different from the empty set, then X and Y are separated by, uh, the, 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 yeah, by they are separated. I mean, uh, um, you take the open set generated by the minimum between the singleton minimum between X and Y, X, sorry, the minimum of X minus Y. X belongs to this one, Y belongs to the minimum that belongs to Y, but not belongs to X. And the, 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 these two basic open sets, they do not uh, intersect, so you're fine. But if X is strictly included in Y, when then you only have Y belongs to uh, the open set generated by um, the, the minimum of Y minus, a, minus X, and X does not belong to this one. Uh, another way of looking at the fact that uh, it is um, T0, but it is not T1, T1 spaces, they satisfy that singleton are closed, right? So if you look at omega and singleton omega, is it closed? No, it's not closed because omega belongs to any non-empty uh, open set. An open set code. Yeah. Okay, this is clear. I skip that, I skip that. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll do that. So I, I come to this definition. So the goal is to explain to you what uh, it means to be uh, omega, an omega algebraic domain. So first I start with a, with a post set. Uh, since we're considering the, the scope domain, imagine that this post set is, you take as elements all the subsets of the integers and the ordering is just the inclusion, right? So a directed set is a set such that every pair of elements has an upper bound, right? So for us, it would mean if in my directed set, I have one set, another one, then I have a, another set that contains the union of these two, right? That's what it means. What is a DCPO? This is the notion that you, you've seen a, a few slides ago. Uh, directed complete post set. So it means that every directed set has a supremum. So for us, it would mean, what, 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 what is the supremum? The supremum is the least upper bound. For us, it means if you consider a set of uh, subsets of the integers, which is directed, then the supremum would just be the union of your set. This way below relation, known as the approximation relation, it's a bit tricky. You say that it's written like this, X is way below Y. It means for all directed set D, such that Y is below the supremum of D, there exists an element inside your directed set such that X is less equal than D. So the idea, I don't, I don't want to give you an idea right now, but uh, the idea is that X appears in any system of approximations of Y, or X is a necessary piece of information of Y, right? One thing, if X is way below Y, you know for sure that X is below Y, and you know that if V is below X, which is way below Y, which is below Z, then V is way below Z. So I would like to concentrate, instead of looking at directly at this way below relation, I would like to look at this notion, right? 
uh, an element of a poset is compact if, if it is way below itself. So let's try to think about what are the elements inside the, um, the, 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 the poset formed of all the subsets of the integers equipped with the inclusions that are way below themselves. First of all, I can tell you that if I am an infinite, um, infinite set of integers, I am not way below myself, right? L -l let's take, for instance, let's take the whole set of integers. I can find a directed set like this, whose supremum will be exactly my set, namely if I take the set that contain all the finite subsets of the integers, right? It's a directed set because if you take two finite sets, the union of these two is also a finite set. And it's in my, in, in my directed set. Okay, now the supremum of my directed set is just the whole space, right? But the whole space, you will never be able to say that the whole space is below, meaning it is included in an element from the directed set because elements are of my directed set, they're finite, right? So no infinite subset of the integers is uh, way below itself. You can show easily that, to the contrary, finite subsets of the integers, they are way below themselves. So the compact elements for the, 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 the poset that we're interested in are exactly the, 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 the finite subsets of the integers. I don't have too much time to, 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 to explain this, but... Okay, so this stands for the, 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 the set of uh, all the elements that are way below y. A poset is called continuous if for all elements of the poset there exists some directed set included in the set of all uh, the elements way below x, whose supremum is x. And this notion of a poset being continuous for a DCPO, it's equivalent to having a basis. And the basis is that a B is a basis for uh, the poset. If for all x inside the poset, the basis intersected with all the elements that are way below x, so in other words, all the elements that are way below x that belong to my basis contains a directed subset D whose supremum is x. Right? And a continuous DCPO is what is called the domain. And last but not least, what is um, when, when we say that we have a, a poset which is algebraic, it's algebraic if its compact elements form a basis. So for us, that would be the compact element. We saw that these were the, uh, the, the, the finite subsets. So it rings a bell because of the, the topology we have, right? An omega, sorry, an algebraic domain is just a dist CPO, which is algebraic, so such that the compact element from a basis. And when do we have, why do we have this notion of omega algebraic domain or omega continuous domain? Omega stands for countable basis. Okay. Yeah, still have 10 minutes, right? Yes, but if you need more, we can also stay. No, 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 I won't be longer. I won't okay. be too long. Okay. So, the Scott topology it was first defined by, by Dana Scott for complete lattices, but later extended for arbitrary posets. And the Scott continuity is in fact used in the denotational semantics of computer program. In fact, it was uh, this way that uh, Scott came up with the first uh, denotational, uh, denotational, sorry, model of, uh, of the lambda calculus, and that was like uh, over 60 years ago. So some kind of uh, old notion. How do we get a, a topology uh, from, from, from a DCPO? You said that a subset of your poset is cut open, and you recover the topology that uh, I presented on the, on the Scott domain. If it's upward closed, meaning if you have something in the open set, everything above is also in the open set. And all directed sets with supremum in O have non-empty intersection with O. So if you think that inside your open set, you have an infinite set of integers inside your open set, 
then I can build, I can consider all the finite subsets of my infinite set. This will be a directed set whose supremum will be my infinite set. This says that this directed set with supremum in O because it's my infinite set has to intersect my open set. Therefore, inside my open set, there exists a finite set, a finite subset of my infinite set. Therefore, all extension of my finite set belong to my open set. So I hope I, I mean, at least I try to give you a few, uh, a few intuitions. I, I know um, at first it's not that, that, that obvious. Okay, let's compare. So you have Polish spaces on one side with complete metric. You have omega algebraic domain, omega continuous model with the notion of DCPO. You have countable dense subset on one side. You have countable approximation basis on one side. You have Hausdorff topology on one side, T2, and you have T0 Kolmogorov on the other side. So from a computation science viewpoint, directed set and supremum, so they correspond to the fact that information increases and converges. The notion of approximation basis, it uh, talks about the fact that finitary informations approximate infinitary one. And the difference between positive information and positive and negative information is the difference between T0 and T2. I'll explain the notion of, uh, of positive and positive and negative information in, 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 in a few minutes. So think of, posit of positive and negative information, think in terms of recursive set. If you have a recursive set, you ask your, your, your Turing machine, which is a decider, does that my, 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 my word belong to my recursive set? The machine will work, will stop and tell you yes or no. It gives you positive information, it's in it. Negative, it fits not. Only positive information is what you have when you have a recursively enumerable set. So you have a Turing machine that will work and will answer you yes if the, the word belongs to your recursively enumerable set, but it may never give you any answer if it does not, right? So let's go back to uh, the continuous reductions on the scope domain now. That's what we were interested in. Yeah, so there was this paper by uh, Veronica Becher and Serge Grigoriev where it was written that like kind of a, it's well known that one cannot come up with a game for um, the, 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 the wedge reduction. So I decided, so let's try to, to, to put a game. Of course, they, they had good reason why there was no game because you, you couldn't get a game with the notion of a, a strategy that would make a wedge lemma work, but let's consider this game. So you, I have A and B. So A and B, they are a subset, they are sets of sets of integers, right? So player one play F0, which is a finite set of integer. Player two play I0, which is either a finite or an infinite set of integer, right? Player one plays F1, which is still finite, but has to extend F0. It can be the same, it can be F0, but it has to extend. And player two plays I1, which is still finite or infinite, but, can, but has to extend I0. And it goes on like this, right? For omega many moves. So at the end, you collect what you get, so you have two strictly, not strictly, two increasing sequences. For one, you end up with X, which is the union of the Fn, so this is a set of integer, and Y is the union of the In, another set of integer, and you, you say two wins if and only if the first one played by one belongs to A, and if and only if the second one belongs to B. I mean, that's exactly, that's similar to the, I mean, that's the wage game. Okay. Um, I will say that, so th this is just the same definition. I don't want to look at it. What is an ultra positional strategy for player two? It's not any strategy. It's a mapping from finite, it maps a finite subset of the integer to a subset of integer and the mapping, which is increasing. Increasing means if F is included in F prime, then sigma F, what is played when, when player one plays F is included in what um, player two plays when, when one plays uh, F prime, right? This is what it means. So position, positional means, in fact, it doesn't depend on the history of the game. You play something at the position that you're in, it doesn't depend on what's been played before, in fact. 
The result is that A wage reduces to B if and only if player two has a winning ultra positional strategy in this game. This is, this is not difficult to prove. So this is a way of presenting things. You may say, well, this is complicated. This notion of a winning ultra positional strategy is not clear how we can uh, uh, check that, that a given strategy is like this. Yes, but sometimes if you can show that one has a winning strategy, you for sure know that two has no strategy. So in particular, no uh, ultra positional winning strategy. So this is exactly uh, how we used it. Viktor Selivanov has proved that if A is a uh, set of subsets of the integers, A is if A is delta zero two, then A is non-safe dual. It does not reduce to its complement. In fact, using this game, you can show that whatever A we consider, A is non-safe dual. Why? Look at this winning strategy for player one. I play the empty set. Player two play A zero, which may be infinite. I play I0 intersected with singleton zero. Player two plays I1, I play I1 intersected with singleton, sorry, with zero one, and so on and so forth. So I'm player one, I only play finite sets, but at the end, for sure, what has been played by player one, this Y is exactly the same as what has been played by two, and Y belongs to A if and only if Y does not belong to the complement of, of A. So one has a winning strategy in this game, so two does not have an ultra positional winning strategy, so A does not reduce to the complement of A. So you only have a uh, non safe dual sets. Hierarchy on the, on the scope domain. So this is the Borel hierarchy, same definition as before, except for this level, sigma zero alpha, you take all the A's, which are countable unions of, you have, you have the difference of two sets, A n and A prime n, and you take them at, at a lower level. That's the only difference between the, 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 the usual definition of the Borel hierarchy and this one. Uh, Debrecht proved that for uncountable quasi polish spaces, the following hierarchies do not collapse. So this is true for our scope domain. The Borel hierarchy does not collapse. The house does rest of here hierarchy does not collapse so they look the same as um, as in the uh, as in the the, 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 the the counter space case okay so it looks the same but let's focus on this part delta zero two okay inside delta zero two you have open close we have the house um, of Kuratovsky hierarchy that you see coming here what can we say there we can say that this, is, this was due to uh, Viktor Selivanov. When n is an integer, the difference of n sigma zero one sets minus, this is the dual class, forms a wage degrees, a wage degree. So it started well. We thought, well, probably it's gonna be nice. What happens above? If alpha is infinite, so the picture is like this. You have y alpha, z alpha. Y alpha and z alpha, they belong to your class. They are incomparable. And they satisfy that if you take any A which belong to the same class, then A reduces y alpha or it re reduces z alpha. It reduces y alpha precisely when W does not belong to A. And if W belongs to A, you know that is the other case. So these are minimal elements. Uh, Veronika Becher and Grigoriev, they show that there exists a many maximal element, C alpha. So it looks like this. Question, what's, what's in there? What's in there? Does it look nice? Once again, we at the very low level, differences of alpha sigma zero one. For instance, alpha is omega. So differences of omega open sets. The answer is very bad. We have infinite anti-chain and infinite descending ch uh, chain. So how, how was it proved, all this? So maybe I'm gonna skip this, I don't have time, but I, I'm gonna show you the, 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 the core of the proof. Uh, we're gonna use a colored countable poset. So what I mean by this, uh, a poset would be a countable set. You have um, the ordering on the countable on, on this countable set and the coloring. You, we only color with zero and one. Zero is for outside, one is for inside, name, of course, right? Uh, 
And I say, given two posets like this, P is less than Q, is below Q, if there exists an order preserving and color preserving function um, from F to Q. F, sorry, from P to Q. And then we consider the class of embeddable posets, which is a subclass of the poset that considered. So I don't want to give the definition here. I, I, I gave just a few a few things. There is no infinite uh, branch in my in my in my poset. Uh, there is an injection from my poset um, to, um, to 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 the class of uh, of all the um, the set of all the finite subsets of the integers, which is a homomorphism. Uh, P equipped with the, 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 the ordering on the poset on the, on the other end, on the other side, you look at the inclusion as the ordering. So it was proved mainly by Louis Viomier, who was a PhD student of mine, that there exists an order embedding. So you can embed what? You look at this class of uh, embeddable poset, quotiented by equivalence. You embed this into the delta zero two subsets uh, of the of the of the scope domain uh, equipped with the wage ordering, of course, corresponded by uh, the equivalent relation. So you embed this into the wage degrees of the delta zero two subsets. So for this, maybe I have two minutes, and I show you a game, and that's that's I'll be that's be over. So the game is like this: you have two players. One plays one and two. They play elements in P for one, in Q for two, okay? And we say that two wins the game if and only if whatever M and N you consider, if Pn is below Pm, Qn must be below Qm. So you, you, you too much must match the order that, that one uh, designs. And also the coloring should be the, the same. If the color of Pn is one, the color of um, Qn should be one also. So two reproduces otherwise and color wise, the run that one is producing in P. And an ultra positional strategy for player two is just a mapping from the first poset to the second poset. You see this notion of ultra positional strategy coming. Uh, and you have that P is less than Q if and only if two has an, um, an ultra positional strategy in this game. So I will show you one thing. I will show you two posets, and I will show you that P2 is less equal than P1, but P1 is not less equal than P2, which will show you that P2 is strictly below P1. But if you understand this, you can create a P3, P4, P5, and you can build an infinite descending sequence. So why is this one called P1. So you, you see first that uh, you have colored nodes, let's say they're colored by one, and you have others that are not colored, so colored by zero, let's say. It's P1 because of its shape. You go one step to the right, one step up. One step to the right, one step up. One step to the right, one step up. If I look at P2, two steps to the right, one step up. Two steps to the right, one step up. So you can imagine what P3, P4, P5 are. So in this game, the player two has a winning strategy. So I will show you a strategy for player two. Player one plays here. I play, uh, imagine I am player two. I play uh, the exam state position on, on the other side. Player two plays another position, not colored here too. I, I match it. Player two plays this third position, I place this third position here. If, I, if he plays here, I have to play something also this way. If he plays here, I play there. So I, I, I always match everything that, that he does. You see that it seems that there, there are more nodes in, in, in P1. I mean, it's, it's bigger. OK, you can have a look at it and get convinced that player two has a winning strategy in this game. I will show you that in the other one, so Two is in charge of P2 now, and one is in charge of P1. This is one who has a winning strategy. So I imagine I am P1, so I play one here. Player two play one somewhere. I will play above and uncolored. Player two will play, she will play above and uncolored. I go down. She has to go down 
with a colored one. So she has to go there. I go up with an uncolored one. So she goes up. I go down with a colored one. She forces her to go down. And so on and so forth until, well, until what? Until we are here. What I do when we are here, I, if you see the, 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 the line above, sorry, just the line above has more elements than the line above this one. So I go and I play this one, which is colored. She has to play above colored. I play above uncolored. She plays uncolored. And then, of course, she gets stuck and I win, right? So you, get, you can get convinced that um, easily that, well, this is a winning strategy. It's a bit more complicated than that, to, just to ch check things. But the whole thing is, so under the crux of the proof was due to Louis Viamé. He looks like a psychopath on the photograph, but uh, he was a very nice guy. Uh, there exists. So Paul sets PN and QNs, um, such that you have an increase in descending sequences of the PNs and all the QNs, they're all uh, incompar incomparable. So then this tells you uh, that we can have delta zero two subsets of P omega uh, that form an infinite descending uh, chain for the wage ordering and also others that form an infinite uh, anti-chain. This shows that Delta zero two of P omega is, is not a well quasi order. In fact, it's really bad. It looks like this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jacques. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. <clears throat> Let me ask if there are questions. Uh, I do have a question about conciliatory sets. Um, I'm not sure I understood correctly. Uh, so we said that on the space two to the omega union two to the less of omega, uh, there is no topology such that the conciliatory reduction, let's say, um, what like, yeah, such that the this is reduction is the same of the continuous reduction, yeah, right? That's result by Ricardo, yeah. Okay, um, to go back, huh? is it is it like? Uh, could you give like a hint of why it does it happen or is it too complicated? Uh, frankly, I don't remember the whole proof. Uh, I don't remember the whole proof right now. Um, if Ricardo is there, he could tell you, but uh, Ricardo had to left, I guess. He, he left, yeah. No, he is no longer. Uh... Uh, no, no, I remember it's not too complicated, but I, I don't have the proof right now. I mean, it's, it's not something that you do in five minutes, but. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It was very well, interesting. But that, that was an interesting result. I mean, he, I'd been asked by many people, including Louvo and others, well, find the topology so that it, it, it works for continuous reduction, but uh, there's not. That's what he proved. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, if not, I have uh, some questions. I, I asked just two. <laughs> I have more than that. But one is mathematical. Uh, so you showed, you sketched the proof of the fact that we have a descending chain yeah. uh, inside Delta Zero Two. And, uh, and then you said that there is also uh, some anti chains. Yeah. Mm, the first thing is. Uh, the, the the statement is seems like slightly more precise in saying that in each difference class yeah you have this pattern yeah exactly well, from your proof just look okay you embed this in delta zero two and and that's it so yeah. how much is difficult to calibrate the construction to go inside one specific difference instead of just going inside delta zero two broadly no 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 it's just that uh, I mean it, it was simple to say delta zero two than to say the difference of alpha uh, sigma zero one minus the difference of alpha church, uh, you know, that, that, that's why I brought this. No, but I mean, the, the anti chain is in one of the differences, right? Not, not yeah. in the union of the differences. Yeah. So may, maybe I missed something, but I, I was, uh, I was expecting that you have this embedding of these trees. I mean, labeled trees or colored trees. Yeah. Partial orders. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is a theorem, but the proof 
I, I don't see in the proof how can you get exactly inside one difference if I give you omega plus two. Yeah, because I didn't show you what the relation between uh, this uh, embeddable post set on one side and uh, the delta zero two subset on the other side. Uh -huh. I didn't okay. see anything about that. There the, is the, something the, behind. The paper, by the way, I mean, this has been published during COVID. This is this one, right? Mm -hmm. It's called the weight order on the Scott domain is not a well quasi order. And uh, you, 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 you get all the, all the technical details, but frankly, I mean, it's not something that I would have liked to, uh, to give a presentation about, yeah, okay. otherwise but... I would have done that for one hour and uh, I would have, I mean, you would have hated me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got it. But, uh, let me ask just, uh, one question about this. Is it that you are changing the trees, the, the partial order sets to change the alpha? Or you just use the same trees and embed it in a different way to go into the alpha. Because yeah. I, if I had to prove this theorem, I would have two strategies, either complicating the trees or complicating the embedding of the, well, not trees or partial orders, or complicating the embedding of partial orders in the Scott domain. So which is the correct uh, direction? Do you yeah, want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just change the alpha but, and you keep the same, the same trees, yeah. Okay, so combinatorial is the same trick, but yeah, you change yeah. things so that you yeah, and so you change the embedding essentially. Okay, I got yeah, it. Yeah, and something that I didn't talk about, but uh, you use you use this. I mean, I, I skipped this this slide, and this slide says something about delta zero two subsets. Uh, they, they, they they are they are relatively simple. They are, they satisfy this property that they are approximable, and uh, and approximable means this: uh, a set is approximable. If every x that belongs to A satisfy, there exists some finite f that is included in x such that so this this is all the y's so all the sets that extends f but that are included in x they are also in A. Mm -hmm. So you know what I mean? So if you have a finite set, it's not interesting. If X is finite, you, you can take F is X. But if X is infinite, it means there exists a finite subset of your X such that every set that extends this finite subset, it's also in A. So we use the fact that they have this, uh, this property uh, to make things work. But if I may add one thing, you may say, well, 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 um, that's not what you did, but you show that it is bad at uh, at a low level. So sorry, I'm I'm going there. You say that it's bad uh, at the level which is inside delta zero two. Maybe it's better ab uh, above this. I can take uh, these inf infinite anti chains here and construct the same above. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. So yeah. okay, not directly. Yeah. I take I take this one. And I compose with sets that are more complicated, and and, and I get these. It uh, remains uh, an anti-chain. Yeah. So, so it, it's bad everywhere except at the very low level. And also, if there are no other questions, I yeah. don't want to be the <laughs> the one ask. Okay, I have a, a curiosity now. This is not mathematical. Uh, I I've been in touch with this community in computer science working on Scott domains. I know the people you were uh, mentioning during your yeah. talk. I always wondered, uh, is there any uh, serious application in real computer science of the topological complexity on these domains? I mean, we, we, we build all of this because it's interesting mathematically yeah. and we are using objects from computer science, but how it is received from, for com from computer scientists? Do they see that there is something useful for them in this topological complexity on these code domains? On this code domain, no, I've I, I not seen that. No, I've not seen that, no. yeah. Yeah, okay. on the counter space, definitely, okay. hundred percent sure. But uh, on the Scott domain, not so seems, no, uh, seems more mathematics than computer science. Then I mean, we are studying interesting spaces which are relevant for them, but it's just mathematics, yeah, not exactly. Okay, I see. Yeah, it was just a curiosity. <laughs> <Was> yeah. <laughs> okay. Are there other questions from the audience? So if not, uh, let's thanks Jacques again. Thank you. Thank you.